thank you. Uh. So I will start now. Can you see my screen, uh, everyone? Uh? Okay, so a very good evening to everyone. So tonight is uh, 30th of January, uh, what they call uh, 2021. So very good evening, very good morning, very good afternoon. Uh, anyone on this planet, uh, we hope also they can see us in the International Space Station, the YouTube there, all right? So today is uh, 30th of January, let's look at it. So it looks a bit small, let me enlarge the screen. I'll present the first three pictures followed by our members, all right? So now you look here, if you see here, the uh, January the 30th, the southern sky at 30,000 feet. Now, if you look at this picture, of course, you 30th of January, you see here, this is the, uh, the Milky Way and the southern part of the sky here, beautiful, all right? But then I will reuse the, make the picture smaller here now. If you look at this picture, there's something, there's nothing new in it. Many people are taking this. But what is interesting is the unique way that this picture was taken by our uh, Mr. Rav Rona, a landscape photographer from Switzerland. So if you look here at the information, he's taking a, a, a flight, a flying at 38,000 feet. That means most likely he's flying from Europe and he's going if, and he's applying towards uh, what they call Peru uh, and the plane is facing south. Now, to be able to take this picture, it means that the plane is facing, flying directly south in a straight line. The plane cannot turn left and right, turn left and right is gone. So as the plane fly left and right, this uh, web loaner is smart. He went into the cockpit, uh, the flight cabin where the pilots are flying. So in front of them, you see the, the window, you see the, the sun sky like this one. Wow, very beautiful, you see? And what he did is he point his camera through the cockpit window at the south, flying in a straight line and no, no turning left and right straight line. And he keep on taking the pictures, right? That means what? One thing, one, when you see like that, it means that the cockpit window must be very clean. If the pilot's cabin, the cockpit window is dirty, then you see the picture won't be so nice. So the, the cockpit window must be clean. And as you fly in the straight line, you keep on taking picture, all right? And then it's flying at 38,000 feet. Normally, let's say you fly from Malaysia to Europe, it's many thousand feet. Let's say 10,000 meters, lah, so 30,000 feet, higher than Mount Everest. So you fly there, so all the clouds are below, and then you can see all the, the beautiful park Milky Way, right? Our Ita Carina Nebula, and then I'm not going to say more because for the first of this month, you have a similar picture. Our Marcus, our young member, will explain. So this is the Southern Cross, all right? Ita Carina Nebula, the Coast Sack, all right? And this is the last Magellanic Club, small Magellanic Club, and this is the bright star in the Southern Sky called Canopus. So the, 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 the something new in about this picture, the way he took it in the pilot's uh, uh, the cabin there. Flying straight south, keep on taking the picture, and then he stack them. And you see, very nice, you know. That means there's no tripod, you know, flying in a straight line. And then he got this. And of course, this is the, on the earth below, got clouds. And here, just after sunset, you can see the sunset. So I really like this. So nothing new, but the way it's taken is very, very unique. First time, right? So later on, somewhere here, you have one Sigma of Pantis, the South Pole Star, which Marcus explained, all right? So that's for 30th of January. Let's go to yesterday's picture. Oh, I really like this. 29th of January, which is our North American Nightscape, all right, by this uh, Leron Gessman. Now, Leron Gessman, he's actually a young, very young uh, landscape photographer from British Columbia in Canada, all right? So he's a Canadian, 20 years old. So he called this North American Nightscape. So basically, he, this is the, 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 the nebula, all right? And these are the two mountains, and they have a name for this. These are known as the lions. So if I make it bigger like this, okay? So you see the two lions there, the mountain, and this is taken in moonlight, not sunlight, moonlight. And then above it, you, you see like that. So basically like this. So there's a, some, some trick photography here. That means he actually put on his uh, telescope, on uh, what they call magnification on a tracking mount. So as the as the nebula, the nebula city move from left to right, from east to west, from west to east, all right, as it move like that, so his telescope will track it. And track it, it will keep on, add on the color, so bright and bright and bright. So the red color is, of course, 
because in the Milky Way, interstellar space, a lot of those, uh, what they call clouds, you know, and this is made of a lot of the uh, hydrogen atoms there. All right, either new, either atomic hydrogen, H1 region, or ionized hydrogen, H2 region. And this is the, actually taken in hydrogen alpha light, all right, which is 656 nanometer red color. And this is the nebula. I'll talk about it a bit later. And here, he took a satellite picture in his, his normal camera, just tip snap the, the landscape here, the snow mountain, the two lions. And later on, he joined this nebula and the two mountains together. All right, so this is beautiful, all right? And this is, we know that this way, this is, uh, this is of course, the uh, North American Nebula, and this is the Pelican Nebula, in where, in Cygnus the Swan. And here is the bright star they named, all right? So this is uh, the one taken yesterday, shown next to But if you go, uh, they you know, taken earlier also by other uh, uh, amateurs, you can see the, the two objects here, all right? Okay. The one here is NGC 7000, and then this one is IC 5070. So NGC is, of course, the new general catalog. IC is the in index catalog. So this catalog is actually prepared by our uh, Emil Dreyer, one British Danish astronomer, right? In 1870, uh, 1888, he started that. Uh. So I will show another picture by another guy, more beautiful one, actually, uh, you see here, we have our NGC 7000 and IC 5070. There you are. There you are. You see here. Now, here is our North American Nebula. Here is the Pelican Nebula. Why is it North American? Look carefully. Huh? It's a bit tilted. Huh? So here is Canada, USA. This is Florida. This is California. And here is the Pelican, the bird, you know, with the long beak. So this is the head of the bird. This is a long beak. And this is the wings of the bird. So this is a Pelican Nebula, very nice. So what 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 what, what this guy, uh, Leon Gersman, is actually a landscape photographer, not an astro, astro photographer, landscape photographer. He took a picture by checking this uh, nebula, all right, once uh, for some time to get this picture, and he take a second picture and he joined them up together. This is very beautiful, all right. So this is taken from uh, north of Vancouver. Vancouver, remember, is on the northwestern side of North America, just above Oregon. All right, uh, just above California. So this is beautiful. And of course, the red color is because of the hydrogen alpha. No, hydrogen atoms have thousands of spectral lines. But the visible light lines are only four. And then the red one, 656 nanometer, is the brightest one. So actually, this is in hydrogen alpha. Very nice. Oh, wow. This is our North American nightscape. That means the snow mountain and the, the what they call uh, emission nebula inside our Milky Way. Beautiful, all right? We go to the third one is January the 28th, all right? This is our, wow, Nasir 66 close up. If you look carefully here, it's what? NASA, which is, you know, ESA is European Space Agency, Hubble, but the moment you see like that, huh, you know that it is actually taken by Hubble. Remember, the research uh, data of Hubble is used both by the Americans, which is NASA, and by the Europeans, which is uh, ESA. Of course, ESA is a European Space Agency. Related to ESA is ESO, European Southern Observatory. So all related. So basically, it's done by, processed by this guy. I checked, uh, I think he looks like he's an uh, Israeli astrophotographer from Israel. So he processed it. So remember, the professional astronomers don't have time to process now. The amateurs got time to process. He processes you go, beautiful. What is this? Nasir 66 close up. So this is Nasir object number 66 close up. And you can see the center of the of the of the bows of that galaxy. And see it's a spiral galaxy about 35 million light years away. Right? And it is about and this region here is in the center, the bow. 30,000 light years. So it's similar to our Milky Way. Milky Way is diameter, the center of the Milky, the Milky Way also about 30,000 light years. All right. The diameter of the Milky Way, whole Milky Way is 100,000 light years. All right. So this is very nice. And you can see also the spiral arm. All right. And you know that the pink color is what? Starburst. The galaxies, the young galaxies, no, the, the young stars are being born very fast. So that's why it's a pink color. Pink color means what? Hydrogen alpha. Right. So a lot of stars are being born here. 
And this Nasir 66 is part of the so-called Rio Triplet. All right, I'll show you the road trip, but this another airport, 18 April 2019, last year. So this is the Rio triplet in Rio, taken by one European astrophotographer, Marcus Bauer. So these are three, three galaxies form up the Rio triplet. And this one is the one we saw earlier, Messier 66. So, so these are three. So these three galaxies uh, have tidal interactions. The gravity of each and uh, is being affected by the other. So you see some distortion in the shape of the galaxy. So this Messier 66 is part of the trio triplet, all right? Which is the one we are seeing here, all right? Here. So I think uh, that's enough for me, okay? So Mr. Lai can continue. Okay, Lai? Yes, all right. right. So uh, share screen first. Yeah. All right. So good evening, everyone. So nice to meet you all again in this airport session. So I'll proceed with the next picture, which is 26 of January. We have this picture by Daniel Nobre, which is uh, central of this NGC 1316, which is also a galaxy. And looking at the title, we know that this is actually after galaxies collide. That means this is the end product of galaxy collision. So this NGC 1316 actually located in this uh, in this constellation called Fornax. And then uh, it's a southern hemisphere constellation. That means if you went to the southern hemisphere, you could have a better observation on this galaxy. So uh, the shape of this galaxy is a little bit different from what we used to know. We, we, are, we are familiar with this pirate galaxy, vast pirate galaxy. Uh, we have this elliptical galaxies and also irregular galaxies. But today, this one, they call it, they categorize it as lenticular galaxy. Mm. Uh, it's actually an intermediate galaxy, intermediate shape of galaxy uh, the morphologies is intermediate between these elliptical galaxies and spiral galaxy uh, it has a large disc large scale disc but it does not have this large scale arm so they call it a lenticular galaxy and this this uh, galaxy is actually located uh, about 60 million light years away from us so that means the image uh, we see now it's actually what happened 60 million like uh, 60 million years ago and the collision this is the end product of the collision so that means it took a few billion years for the co collision to happen and then take a long time all right uh, this collision of galaxy does not uh, does not actually looks like the collision that we familiar when we learn in physics, two balls collide together in a split second, the collision and uh, yeah. the collision for a galaxy, it takes a very long time, right? Take years, thousand years, hundred thousand years or million years. So this is the end product of uh, galaxy collision. So um, one more thing about this galaxy collision is we know that our Milky Way one day will collide, all right? About 4.5 million years. 4.5 billion years later, we will collide with this uh, our nearby galaxies called the Andromeda. So, whether our end product of this collision of Milky Way and this Andromeda, whether will it be same as the shape of this galaxy or we will form other or other shape of galaxy, we still don't know. But then, uh, this is what will happen to us one day. All right, the collision of Milky Way and this Andromeda galaxy. Uh, the predicted or the simulated shape of the collision of Andromeda and Milky Way were, is a giant elliptical, but it haven't happened yet, so we are not sure about it. All right, so let's proceed to the next one. All right, uh, just an add on, all right, which is also taken by Hubble, all right, as Dr. Chong mentioned just now. That's by amateur astronomers, all right. Next, we have 25th of uh, January. All right, I actually like this uh, picture a lot. All right, we have landscape and also we have 
the sky. All right. So this is actually the southern sky. All right. We have the southern cross over here, and then we have the Cossack Nebula and the Carina Nebula over here. So uh, just a little bit introduction of this southern cross. All right. It's a to me it's a very simple constellation. All right, uh, it has the smallest area, occupied the smallest area of the sky and can be observed on the southern hemisphere. All right, uh, I remember in one of the Kapasing session, we have one friend, Sergei, he, he's from Russia and then he, he tells us about this. He said to observe Southern Cross, he traveled all the way from Moscow to Sri Lanka to observe this Southern Cross because in Moscow, they could not actually see this Southern Cross because it's on the uh, southern sky. Right, so uh, this Southern Cross have a little bit navigation function, which is actually, you see this, uh, we call the Crossix, Crossix Alpha, all right, to cross the red one over here, all right, you join this line to the blue one over here, uh, we call it the Gamma Crossis, all right, or we call it the Gacrux. Uh, this line is actually pointing towards south, but not the exact south, so basically, it can tell us about a brief direction on where the south is. So this is about uh, the picture for 25th of January. Hello, I got one question, huh? interesting question. Yeah. On top of the mountain, there's a, a orangey yellow glow. Huh? What yeah, yeah. Like, what star is that? Huh? On top of the mountain. Huh? Uh, over here, there's the, what we call, there's this uh explanation given over here let me enlarge this huh? yeah. what is right on top of the top of the volcano on top of the snow line there's a yellow or orangey uh half circle there <laughs> just to test you only lah. what is that object huh oh good idea i i, I read the thing but then i <laughs> forgot yeah, yeah, yeah. The is the i i suspect it is a volcanic explosion volcano lava coming up Ah, uh, it's a volcano or lava. That's why the the uh, yellow orange color la. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Hmm. I think so. Yeah la. I guess so. All right. So that's all from me. Yeah. So, yeah. Session. So I'll pass pass over to Marcus. So Marcus is uh, is our very young member. All right. It's not only form one. All right. So Marcus, because Lyle about uh, one picture too long, so he split only two. So Marcus, you are next. So Marcus, you talk about give me give us a date lah. What date are you talking about? Marcus, you're on. Okay. Um. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Marcus. Like Dr. Chang has said, I'm a member of the Astronomy Society of Penang, and today I'll be talking about the airport for first of January this year. So this picture here was taken by two um. Two astronomers and photographers from the Czech Republic in Central Europe, Petro Horalik and Joseph Kujal. In this picture, you can see there's two galaxies, which is the large Magellanic clouds and small Magellanic clouds. These two galaxies are our satellite galaxies, and which means that they orbit around the Milky Way galaxy. They are also called dwarf galaxies. And up here, you can see here that's our Milky Way galaxy. But there's not only that over there. You can also see there's a constellation called the Southern Cross, also known as Crux. This star here, the four stars in the Southern Cross are called Gamma Crucis, Delta Crucis, Beta Crucis, Alpha Crucis. Or they're also called Gay Crux, Mimosa, Delta Crucis, A Crux. And but and under the left arm of the Southern Cross, you can see there's a absorption nebula called the Cossack Nebula. This nebula is well, it's called an absorption nebula because it absorbs light. It is it's dark. It's very dark. You can't see any light there, and it's made out of gas and dust like a normal nebula. But that's not the only nebula up here. On the on the right side of this picture, you can see Eta Carina. This nebula is four times bigger and brighter than the famous Orion Nebula. Okay, but that's not the only special thing in this picture. In this picture, if I zoom in, I'm going to need to um hold on. 
if I zoom in. Can see now, Marcus is coming, yeah? Yeah, wait, hold on, I need to um zoom in. You can see there's a I need to hold on, I need to find it. Yes, it's over here. This star over here is very tiny, it's a magnitude 5 star, it's called Sigma Octantis. It is one degree of the south um the exact south pole. The exact south celestial pole. This star can also be found on the Brazilian national flag. You can see it right over here. Here they can see number one, two, all these numbers here represents the different constellations and stars on the flag. And you can see number seven here is Sigma Octantis, right over here. It is the faintest star to be ever shown on a national flag. flag. The other constellations and stars here are Canis Major, Procyron, Sirius, Canopus, and many others. And okay, and also this these three words over here, Odin, E Progresso, you might be wondering what does it mean and why is it on the Bra Brazilian flag? Well, these three words are Portuguese because Brazil was colonized by the Portuguese, so now they mainly speak uh, Portuguese. It's called order and progress, which means that the which means that um the country wants to like have order and progress towards the future. So um so uh yeah, that's all for me to um, explain. This is the um yeah, I need to go and yeah, this is this is all for the twenty twenty one January one picture. Yeah. So we proceed to Dr. Zhang, you're muted. Yeah. So welcome John Su to our Dr. John Su to our presentation. Um, hello everyone. So I'm uh, Dr. John Su from USM. I think uh, this is my first time joining the the A part as well. So uh, I believe some of my students might be watching this as well. So hello. Okay, so uh, my job today is to, to uh, tell you a bit about six pictures, but then uh, I will cut it into half. So I will first talk about the first three pictures and then I'll pass it back to Dr. Chong again. Okay, so I don't uh, get you bored out, right? So the first picture that we're going to see today, okay, let me just get this set up, right? So as you can see, this picture over here, it looks like a tumbleweed. Okay, so, so for some of you who are more receptive, you may identify this as an explosion. Okay, so it looks like something that has exploded in the past, and it looks like there's a lot of, you know, like a blue colored, uh, you know, uh, things that are moving away from it. Okay, so this object is what we call as a supernova remnant. Okay, a supernova remnant means that there was a supernova. A supernova basically is like a, the end point of uh, something, right? So for example, a star, you know, uh, uh, beyond a certain mass, after it has burned for a long time and then it dies, then it will just explode. Okay, so a supernova remnant means that it explodes and the thing continues to expand, which is what this uh, Cassiopeia A is, right? So as you can see, uh, this thing has been uh, around for a long time, right? So uh, this was the A-Pod picture for 23rd January. It was seen uh, 350 years ago. Okay, uh, as you can see, the, this, it may look small in the sky, right? But so the dimensions of it is actually about uh, 11,000 light years, right? So you must understand a little bit about uh, some, I would say, uh, in terms of the distances, lah, right? So if you think uh, uh, how large or rather how wide our solar system is, it's actually very, very small, right? As compared to even a single light year, right? So even the, the, the closest star that we are trying to get Right, uh, uh, Alpha Centauri system, uh, you know, the uh, Proxima Centauri is about, you know, uh, four light years, right? So you can see that even getting to the nearest star is about four light years. And furthermore, this entire thing is about 11,000 light years. So you can imagine uh, how large this thing actually is, right? And then uh, let's take a look. Okay, uh, so the size itself uh, so it's uh, eleven thousand light years away from us the size itself is about 30 light years okay so that's about you know like uh, four times uh, seven times so that's about seven times the distance to our nearest star right so you can imagine from left to right that's how it looks like so this picture over here as you can see the image credits is actually uh, there's x3 right so uh, given by uh, uh, taken by nasa and there's also optical uh, by this uh, by nasa as well so there's two different kinds of rays Okay, so this is what we call as a composite image. That means uh, you not only take uh, the picture based on 
uh, you know, like just the optical, you also uh, overlay it with some sort of uh, uh, image that was taken in the X-ray. Okay, so we all know X-ray is uh, very high and very penetrating uh, kind of uh, uh, rays, right? So basically, it is uh, the very, very high and, and the very high energy radiation compared with the optical. So in other words, if you are going to see this object in the sky, you only see the optical parts, right? You won't be able to see the X-ray parts. Okay, so this is a composite image in order to tell you what is actually in there. Okay, so uh, many of you, if, if you know Cassiopeia well, right, if you know uh, anything that's like a supernova a remnant, there should be a point, right? There should be one point where this entire explosion happens. Okay, so let me see if I can zoom into it. Right, so if you zoom into the center, right, I'm, I'm going to, I'm not sure if you can see, there's one actually very bright spot in the center. Okay, so in here, for everything that explodes, right, there must be, it must explode from somewhere. So this bright spot over here that you can see, right, this bright spot here is a supernova. Uh, it was a supernova explosion, okay, and what the remnant is, is what we call as a neutron star. Okay, so a neutron star is basically uh, like a very compact star, okay, it's uh, very, very small in size in terms, right, and then uh, you, you won't be able to uh, see it, right? I mean, like in, in the sky, because it's, it's very compact. Sometimes a neutron star is about like 50 kilometers wide or 20 kilometers wide, right? So it's a very compact object. So it is uh, compared to, to a black hole, of course, a black hole is even more compact, okay? And the coloration is very interesting, okay? So uh, as Dr. Chong just now, he mentioned that every time when you see red in, in the sky, usually it's hydrogen, okay? But must remember, put in mind that this is a composite image, that it was taken using X-ray and both optical. So it means that you need to increase that, that color range, you know, in order to, to represent this entire thing. So what we are saying is that the rate that you see in this picture is not actually rate if you see using your eyes. Okay, so it has expanded that color spectrum so that you can see different things. And in this place, you see that red is to represent silicon, yellow representing sulfur, green representing calcium and purple uh, representing iron. Okay, so you see that there's a lot of iron on the, you know, like the this corner over here. In fact, most of the things are on this corner. The iron, the sulfur is coming out, bulging out. The, the calcium, the green ones, right? We have some over here, some over there. Okay, right? So this is Cassiopeia A. So the next image that we're going to take a look at, right? So this, what is this over here? Uh, some of you may think, right? Is it a black hole? Wow, wow, right, because, wow, very nice. Right, so so is it like a very, uh, is it a black hole with something being sucked inside? Okay, so the answer is no. Okay, so uh, if you see based on the patterns of this black stuff, right, that is all around the place, you can guess that it is actually the Milky Way. Okay, so I would say that this is actually a very interesting picture, right? So the person who took this uh, is uh, Alvin Wu, and he called this picture the Milky Ring. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, take a look at it again. So he kind of puts his initials here. Okay, so what happens is that he actually took two years right of effort. He goes around uh, many places and he sort of like patch it up, right? So if you remember, if you look up into the sky, right? So for example, if this is a sky that you see, the Milky Way usually is like just one band all across the sky. Okay, so with all the dust, all the things, and then uh, and all that. So imagine that he has taken this entire picture like a combination of it so he must have looked at one part of the sky right in the southern sky the northern sky and then uh, he patched it up that means uh, different nights you know he patched it up again and then such that he made the entire milky way viewable in terms of like an entire ring so this is i would say a very very pretty and amazing picture right it must be a lot of effort and uh, a lot of uh, i think uh, technical skill as well, right, to, to make this picture uh, so pretty. So it's a 360 degree mosaic, right? It was taken uh, in Western China and also in New Zealand. So why do you need two places to see it? Because, right, so this generally, right, uh, this Milky Way, uh, you want to see things that in, uh, in the south and you want to see things that are in the north, right? So you cannot see them very clearly unless you take a picture in the north, okay? And then you go to somewhere in the south, the southern hemisphere, and then you take so that you can see everything that's over here, okay? So the top bulk, okay, that you see over here is the galactic center. So let me try to zoom in for you. 
right? So this entire region in the top is the galactic center. And just so happened when he took this, there are two things that are on top over here. Okay, this very bright dot over there is called Jupiter. I'm sure all of you know what Jupiter is, right? It's, it's the largest planet in the solar system. And then uh, this thing over here, okay, let me just zoom out, is Antares. So Antares is a very uh, large uh, and bright, uh, bright red star. Okay, so and then we have the bottom. So I'm going to zoom in again. So my eyes are not very good in the sense that I couldn't actually see where Orion is, right? So if you are free, you should go to the website, take a look at this picture, which is uh, the 22nd January one, and try to let me know. I, I believe it should be somewhere this region where the, the Orion is, okay? And then finally, we also have uh, in the middle, the large and small Magellanic clouds, which I think uh, just now uh, Marcus mentioned about it. So the Magellanic clouds are here, these two things over here. Okay, so Magellanic clouds are just basically uh, very uh, irregular galaxies. So uh, mostly uh, stars and dust over the place. So they don't have like a very fixed shape. So that's why they look uh, very weird. Okay, fun fact, why are they called Magellanic clouds? So in the past, uh, astronomers, they live in the north, right? So you probably know that, you know, the, the superpower. And then... Uh, yeah, I know that. So Magellanic clouds are actually in the southern hemisphere. That means there were things that people in the north, right, who live in the north cannot observe. So in order to see the, the, these clouds, you have to cross the equator line, which means that there are actually not uh, a lot of countries, right, compared to those living in the north. I mean, uh, even Malaysia is above the line, right? So that's like Australia, you know, you have to go to places like Australia, uh, Chile, you know, like uh, uh, lower parts of uh, Brazil and all that in order to see, uh, have a good picture of the Magellanic clouds. And so Magellan was one of the people who uh, was on a ship, you know, going uh, uh, towards the southern uh, hemisphere. Uh, that was why it was named after him. Okay, so moving on to the third picture over here. Okay, so this is a very amazing looking picture. So this is not what you would see in real life. So if you, let's say, if you take a camera, you try to uh, use a, a telescope to look at it, you wouldn't be able to see these beautiful lines over here. Okay, uh, I would say beauty is subjective. Uh, some may think that it's not as beautiful. But then again, so it looks like, uh, you know, like it, uh, from far, it looks like a fur of a dog or like a horse or some sort. So these are actually what we call as magnetic field lines. Okay, so for those of you who learn physics, magnetic field is usually written as B, right? So the reason why I write it here is because I can't fit this in one line. So I just shorten it. These are magnetic field lines of the Whirlpool Galaxy. Okay, so the Whirlpool Galaxy is also known as M51. Okay, uh, it's in, in the Messier catalog. So this is very interesting picture because the magnetic fields are something that people have been trying to study for a long time. So let's uh, get back to the enlarged version of this. Okay, so what we wanted to know is, are there, first of all, are there magnetic fields going around in galaxies? And secondly, how do they actually go, right? So this galaxy is basically made out of like billions of stars in that. Okay, so you see that all these red patches, they may be stars, okay? Uh, and then uh, most of the stars are concentrated in these arms over here. So you see that's why there's a spiral shape, right? Okay, sorry, I'm butchering this picture, right? So, so you see that uh, the stars will generally stay around there. And you would expect that, you know, since most of these stars are there, okay? So if people who, who remember physics, right? Uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation has two different fields. One is the electric field, one is the magnetic field. So when you have a moving uh, you know, electric charge, you would produce a magnetic field. And then when you have a changing magnetic field, you would produce an electric field. So this is how physics works. So you would expect that if there are more stars there and if they're highly charged and they're moving around, there would be some sort of magnetic field. Okay, so imagine like we're talking about the magnet, right? So you know that a magnet is, uh, has this magnetic power when you stick it to a fridge, okay? But the problem is, how do you know that there's magnetic field, you know, uh, a magnet that's so far away in this galaxy over here? And we do that by studying uh, the polarization of light, okay, which I'll explain in a little while later. And then by, by studying the uh, how this uh, light is polarized, we can measure the directions, right? So basically, you see these streaks over here, right? These black parts that, that go a, seem to go a certain direction, all these 
are the directions of the magnetic field. Okay, and the fun, I, I would say that this picture is important because we thought that there was some sort of like, uh, you know, like pattern that we can guess, right? So the first idea is that maybe the magnetic field lines follow the direction of the spirals, right? So most of them, they do. But then again, you have this magnetic field line, which is going sideways, okay? And then you see this guy is like totally going left and right. So it's very interesting because it lets us, uh, it, it teaches something, you know, new that, you know, these magnetic field lines, they don't seem to follow some sort of pattern. Okay, and probably there's some other thing that's going on in there that causes uh, the chaotic magnetic field lines. Okay, so uh, as I, I mentioned earlier on, it is due to polarized light. So what happens is that as this dust, they try to reach you, uh, sorry, not dust, the light, as they try to reach you, you know, in between your eyes, you would, they would actually be dust aligned in a certain direction. So let, let me just draw it out over here. So imagine that this is the galaxy, Right? And then you're, you're looking at it, your eye is over here. And as the light passes through, you know, in between there will be like gas clouds, dust clouds that things get passed through. And sometimes the dust, they get aligned, you know, in this direction. Or maybe some dust clouds, they, they, they are longish, so they align in a different direction. Okay, so as the light passes through, they kind of polarize it so that the light that enters the detector or our eye will be polarized in a certain direction. And that direction can actually help us to understand you know, the magnetic field line. Okay, pretty cool, right? So that means without uh, putting a, a fridge, you know, or a magnet, then you can actually see uh, the, the magnetic uh, strength that's of something that's very, very far away. Okay, so uh, another thing interesting about this picture is that we haven't talked about this guy that is on the top, right? So this guy over here, why is it there? And, and what is it doing? You know, what is his uh, function over here? So this entire system, the Whirlpool Galaxy, and this galaxy called M51b, they are known as, uh, you know, like uh, interactive galaxies. That means they're actually nearby such that the gravitational field of this object over here can affect this guy over here. Okay, so that means, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether are they uh, approaching one another or are they leaving uh, each other, right? So just now I think a line mentioned about uh, uh, the, 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 not, uh, the collision of the Andromeda and all that. So in this case, right, so they are interacting with one another, definitely. And scientists are actually paying very close attention to how do they interact with it. So some people say that maybe part of these magnetic field lines at the edge is due to another galaxy that's here that's causing it. So of course, all these are very interesting research questions that uh, people are trying to answer. Okay, so I think uh, that's all for me and I will pass it over to Dr. Chong. Thank you, Dr. John Su. All right. So we continue with the next one, January the 17th. All right. January 17th. Uh, just from unusual galaxy Centaurus A. So a constellation of Centaurus in the sun sky. So this is taken in three wavelengths. The one in blue, all right, you see carefully, the blue one is actually by CXC, uh, Chandra X-ray or, or Observatory. So this is X-ray. All right, uh, Chandra, the telescope is still in space. Huh? So blue is in X-ray. And of course, white is in visible light, the normal telescope. Okay. And then, uh, and then, um, and this is by our, uh, what they call uh, ESO uh, WFI, white field image. All right. Time you need to reset your screen. Okay, wait, wait sorry, sorry, sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, wait, wait. Okay, sorry. Thanks for reminding us. Huh? Okay, so this is our January 17, all right? Just from unusual galaxy Centaurus A in the constellation of Centaurus, uh, starting constellation. So this is taken by three different types of telescope. By our white field imager, all right? White field imager is a telescope in La Silla. Remember, the European Southern Observatory is in Chile. The, the original one is in La Silla. The later one is Parana. So this is in La Silla. So this is a visible light taken by WFI. Now WFI is one of the, the biggest CCD camera in the world. No? Uh, each picture is about 140 megapixels. And then you have the, the red one, which is in our uh, radio wave, all right? or maybe sub-millimeter radio wave. It's taken in our, by, our Max, this is by our Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. 
and by our apex uh, equipment there atacama pathfinder experiment uh sub miniature uh, radio wave telescope in chile all right and of course you have also the the x-ray is by gamma so uh, blue is a uh, x-ray chandra visible light or right, normal telescope and then you have the the what they call the microwave is the way so because you have three different things so basically what you have here is that we know that right in the center you have a black hole here in the center that is uh the the matter material is accreting going around uh, around the center and as it falls in you have two powerful jets in the north and south polar region and it's shooting out but these two jets are not so big you know some of the supermassive uh jets are can the millions of light years across right across one galaxy but anyway you can see them shooting out right so there's a lot of radio wave uh, and also x-ray coming from here right centaurus a is one of the strongest source of uh, what they call real radio in the in the milky way right so this is our uh january the 17 next one is january the 16 no wait a minute january the 15 Wow, 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 hey. January the 15th, Plutonian landscape. All right, remember, uh, many years ago, NASA launched a new horizon telescope. All right, and it, it was launched from the Earth in 2016. All right, uh, 2006. All right, and it took many years. It flew by Pluto in 2015. And when it flew by Pluto, it put, turned, uh, turned back its uh, uh, camera on the on the new horizon telescope. Uh, spacecraft and took a picture of Pluto. So this is about 380 kilometers wide. So beautiful, not so what? A lot of ice mountain. Wow, got name, you know. So now Pluto is no more mystery. You can ask your friend, have you been to Japan? Yes. Have you been to, to uh, uh, what they call London? Yes. Have you been to uh, Pluto? Do you know Pluto? Pluto is no more uh, mystery. Previously, it was just a, a dot. Now, no more mystery. So here got name, you know. So uh, you look here. You have here, uh, so on the left, you have the Noge Mountain, Montes, Montes means mountain, all right? And then here, uh, and then Hillary Mons in the, in the, in the horizon, all right? And here you have the, there's a Russian name here, Sputnik Planum. It's a kind of a smooth area, Planum, for their names, you know, all right? And of course, this is by our, NASA, John Hopkins. So John, Hop John Hopkins is actually the, the UNC that runs the space telescope, Hubble Space Telescope. This is our applied physics laboratory. And also this picture is also related to Southwest Research Institute. Now, you'd be surprised, huh? John Hopkins UNC is a privately funded UNC, you know? John Hopkins. And Southwest Research Institute is a privately funded research institute. This is a private uh, organization. So this is Pluto. Pluto no more mystery. Very cold, of course. Very far away, right? So after flying past the the new horizon, flying past the Pluto on 2015, it flew by, and then two years ago, it flew by the 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 the, the object called Arrokot. At first, it was called Ultima Thule. Now we call it Ar Arrokot. It's the furthest object from the sun flown by by spacecraft, an American spacecraft, New Horizon. So now New Horizon is targeting another object in the Kuiper Belt. All right. The of course other code is an object in the Kuiper belt. All right. We go to the next picture. January the 14th. Some of you may, may be quite familiar with this, right? Okay. Eh? It's an aurora taken from ISS. ISS is not ice cream, huh? International Space Station. All right. So this is expedition number 52, which was launched in 2017, three years ago. And one of them is Jack Fisher. Jack Fisher is one of the American astronauts. So in that mission, you have six astronauts and cosmonauts. So and that is part of the ISS. On top of the ISS, you look down. So basically, we know Aurora are the solar beam particles. Some, sometimes the sun is very active. Eh? So the charged particles, which are the electrons and the protons and the charged ion emitted by the sun very fast. Now, remember, even the normal particles in the solar wind still travel at 500 kilometers per second. Very fast. So from the sun, you're coming, they will go and um, uh, collide with the neutral oxygen and nitrogen uh, molecules in the, in the upper atmosphere and will excite and kick out the electrons from those molecules. So now you have those 
excited molecules, oxygen, nitrogen. So now let, that means those molecules have lost some of the electrons. So later on, the electrons will rearrange themselves and then they fall down to a lower, uh, from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, they'll emit light. So the green one uh, and the red one is for oxygen atom. So in other words, the oxygen atom will, will, uh, will excite and de-excite and give up many, many spectrum lines. So basically this is what? Luminescence. The luminescence is a part of luminescence, what fluorescence. So this is like your fluorescent tube. Lah. A fluorescent tube is the UV light from a uh, kind of uh, uh, atoms uh, in your in the fluorescent tube, give up the UV light. The UV light will go and hit the phosphor, the white uh, coating on the fluorescent tube. And the phosphor will give convert the UV light to visible light. So this is a type of like a fluorescent tube, but this is very high. So now, but this is from the space looking down, you know. Remember, ISS is 400 kilometers in space looking down. And usually Aurora, they say, stretches from 80 kilometers from the Earth's surface to about 600, no, to about, uh, yeah, to about 600 kilometers in space. But remember, space is 100 kilometers long. Anything above 100 kilometers is called space. Below that is called Earth's atmosphere. So most of the aurora is in space, above 100 kilometers. So aurora is from 80 kilometers to 600 over kilometers. So this is taken from the ISS. So this is beautiful. And this is uh, east of Australia. So when you say Australia means what? So this aurora is called Australia, no, Aurora Australis. Remember two types of aurora. You see in Norway, it's called Aurora Borealis. In Norway, in Alaska. In Australia, in Chile, it's called Aurora Australis. Australis means the sun. So this is a sudden aurora. Very nice. All right. We go to, okay, I think that's all. Uh, Mr. Lai, next. Mr. Lai? Yes, yes. So, okay. all right, let me share screen. So, Dr. John, we are exceeding our time, but it's okay. Huh? As long as we feel yeah. comfortable with it, yeah. And see, yeah. Beautiful, lah, right? Beautiful. All right. So, let's proceed. So, I will proceed with another two a pod, which is the 13th and the 12th. So, for 13th of January, I like this a lot, okay? There are two arches sort in the sky. All right. So, looking at this, all right, we see the big deeper over here. So, we know this is a northern sky. All right, so this image, all right, this photo is taken, all right, in, if I'm not mistaken, it's in Norway, is it? Yeah, it's in Norway, the Lofoten Island in Norway. So there are two arches over here. So one is the star arch, all right, it's the Milky Way. And over here we have the Andromeda galaxy, the nearby galaxy below, which we were going to be colliding with that, with it, 4.5 billion years later. And then we have Mars below, right? Uh, Mars is very easy to recognize in the night sky because it's the only red planet we can see from the Earth and it's always red. All right, and then we have the Big Dipper over here and also the Aurora. So just now Dr. Chong gave a, a quite a details explanation on this aurora so even these two arches look very very close to each other in fact uh, they are very far away all right so the, these stars in milky way can be a few light years or thousand light years away but this aurora is just few hundred kilometers away so the distance between this aurora and this uh, milky way the stars in this milky way is still uh, uh, thousands of light years away yeah? all right so this is a image stacked together, or we call it a composite image, which is actually a stacking of 18, 18, 18 photos, okay, 18 shots, 18 images was, was captured. So on the same location, all right, the tripod is set, the camera is set, and then uh, take the it take the photo, he take the photo, and then they take 18 of this, and then it combine all together and we have this final image of this uh, Milky Way and Aurora. So this is the Aurora, Aurora uh, Borealis, Aurora Borealis, which is on the Northern Hemisphere, all right? And this is taken in mid-December. So mid-December, mid-December to 
early March is actually a good time for us to observe uh, this aurora in the northern hemisphere. So during this, during the Christmas break or the New Year break, all right, or even the winter break. So there are actually a lot of tours to this uh, northern part. In Sweden, they go to Lapland. Uh, sorry, in 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 Norway, in Finland, they went to Lapland. In this uh, Sweden, they went to Kiruna to observe this aurora. So they have this aurora hunting tour. All right. So but observing this aurora sometimes by luck. All right. They went there. Uh, the temperature is quite cold. And then it can go up to negative 30 or negative 30 something degrees Celsius. It's very cold outside. And they will come outside to watch this aurora and to take this nice picture. All right. So this is about aurora and the Milky Way. So next we have the 12th of January, which is a very nice photo. Actually, this photo uh, is about this uh, constellation and uh, taken, they call it a historic Brazilian constellation. So this photo actually, let me uh, make the image smaller. Can see better like this. Okay, like this can see the full image. So actually this image tells us something about the combination of culture and astronomy. So in the ancient, ancient times, uh, we always say uh, this astronomy is the most ancient knowledge in the world or the most ancient science we have in the world. Because since the ancient time, we already start to learn astronomy. All right. So in this case, all right, in the ancient time, we know we don't have internet, all right? Like today, we saw something in the sky, we want to know more information about it, we go to Google, or in, in Chinese, we go Baidu, or we go whatever. If we have internet and we have a lot of information we can obtain easily, uh, all this information easily. But in the olden days, they don't have this information. So they don't know what is happening in China, they don't know what is happening in Malaysia, they don't know what is happening in Europe. So, this is in Brazil, the southern part uh, in South America, All right? So they see this, so they have their own constellation, All right? So this is the historic Brazilian constellation. It represents an old man, All right? The old man, uh, which his leg is chopped off by this, uh, by his wife, because he did something wrong and his wife is angry with him, so he chopped, chopped off his leg. So you see, uh, the missing leg, the missing leg is over here, right? The missing leg is over here. And this is actually Orion, all right? So the missing leg is up to Betelgeuse. And then the, the, the normal leg, okay? The normal leg goes through the Orion belt, right? Goes through the Orion belt. So this is the Brazilian, uh, historic Brazilian constellation. So just a little bit of additional information. So the same constellation we have uh, might be, might carry different meaning in different places. So that's why we need today for the sake of learning astronomy to, to ease the communication, we need to standardize everything. That's why we have this uh, international organization called the IAU, International Astronomy Union, which standardize everything, okay? Uh, set a standard for every thing we have. So uh, a simple, Examples of this uh, rule, some rules set by this IAU is all the planets, uh, all the planets in the solar system are named actually under the Roman gods and constellation is, un is named using Greek. All right. So this is about the, what we have. All right. So this is Orion over here. And another example of this different culture have different naming of constellation is for example, we are familiar with the Big Dipper, which we have in the previous image, right? So in the Maya culture, right? The Mayan culture, I think everyone heard about this Mayan before, right? This big, the seven stars of the Big Dipper, they actually represents in the Mayan culture, is actually like representing parrot, right? And then in Rome, in the ancient Rome, they know, they actually recognize this as ox, right? And in Japan, it represents rudder. And then, of course, in China, there are two meanings. One is a big, big dipper, a big, like a big spoon. And it also represents the god carriage. 
All right, and in France, they call it actually a frying pan. So this actually uh, shows that how culture difference, how we know things different and we name things different based on our knowledge and in ancient time. So different culture, we have different naming system, we have different ideas, but we are looking at the same, we are actually looking at the same thing, we are talking about the same thing. So that's all from me about these photos and airport session today. So I'll pass back over to Dr. John Su for the following airport. Thank you, everyone. Okay. All right, so let's continue our story. So I have uh, three more pictures to share. So hope you don't mind. So this first picture that you see over here, right? So it looks like a ball, right? And if you are very, uh, you know, attentive, you may notice that there's something at the back, right? There seems to be a plane, okay? So this plane is actually the ring of uh, Saturn, right? So this guy that we're looking at is actually Titan. Titan is the moon, uh, the largest moon in the solar system and also one of the uh, most important moons of Saturn. Okay, so Saturn's large, uh, uh, largest moon, uh, it is about 5,000 kilometers across. Okay, so uh, compared to our moon, which is about, if I remember correctly, about 2,000 to 3,000 kilometers across. So it's definitely larger than our moon. So this picture was taken, you see, it's uh, in uh, black and white, right? So uh, this is taken by, by NASA, uh, JPL, and Space uh, Science Institute. So what happens is that we are actually looking, there's a spacecraft, right? Uh, Cassini that actually passed by uh, this Titan. And then from the other end, so imagine that you have Saturn over here, right, uh, doing its own business. And then there's Titan, which is rotating around it. Okay, it's definitely not that far, but okay, I, I'm just drawing for illustrations. And then you have a satellite, right, that's looking this way, right, so that you only take this entire uh, moon, you know, in front of Saturn, so so near to this moon such that it blocks out the entire Saturn, okay? So like, I would say it's a fun shot of the moon, right? So you're trying to see of uh, think of any more uh, interesting ways to, to take pictures of moons, right? So you want to look at that. So this moon, the word here, it says that it's in synchronous rotation. So similar to our moon, right? What it means is that there's only the same phase facing uh, the planet. Okay, so for example, uh, if this is Titan, Forever, it will always be this same side that's looking uh, towards uh, Saturn. And then, uh, while well, Saturn can have different rotation rates, it doesn't matter. But then again, that means Titan, whenever it moves over here, it will be the same uh, side facing the, the Saturn. And then when it moves over there, it will be always the same. Okay, so similar like to our moon, where we can only see one side of the moon. So that's why people come up with stories like things that are on the dark side of the moon. Okay, so obviously this part is the dark side of Titan, okay? So Titan is special because it's the only moon in the solar system with a dense atmosphere and a rain cycle. Okay, so imagine that the moon, right? We're talking about a moon, a piece of rock, right? a small piece of rock in the solar system, but yet this guy, he has an atmosphere. Okay, not only he has an atmosphere, there's some sort of rain cycle, okay? It's definitely not water in there, right? So because uh, of how far it is away from the sun, okay? So uh, water is freezing cold, so it's probably some methane or some uh, hydrogen and uh, carbon compound kind of thing uh, that is raining. So it's raining toxic stuff, you know, there's an atmosphere. So there's a lot of things going on, right? So in, in this moon. So that's the reason why some people are actually trying to study Titan. They take pictures of it. So uh, this picture over here, uh, it's not written uh, what kind of, uh, 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 how do you say, the, the kind of a wave of light that you're trying to see. Uh, uh, probably is slightly... Uh, towards the infrared more than the optical, okay? So that means you can't actually see through the atmosphere unless you have, let's say, radio or, you know, like uh, the, the longer wavelength light. So if so, this picture, the fact that you can see something dark over here, it means that it's probably slightly longer wavelength than the optical, okay? And this black stuff over here is actually what we call as the Shangri-La dune. Okay, so a dune basically is uh, like, a mound or like a, a portion of sand or some sort of a thing over there. So it's something like a, a, a slight depression. I mean, it's like a very small, uh, I wouldn't say it's a crater, it's like a, then again, but it's very large. So you can imagine that this entire thing is like 
uh, it's like an entire basin of sand, you know, that, that goes all across the entire moon. Right? So this is uh, quite a large uh, place. Okay, and it's named after Shangri-La. So for those of you who are wondering, Shangri-La is the name of a lot of hotels, right, that we know of. But Shangri-La actually uh, originated from a British novel. Okay, so it was actually naming some very beautiful uh, uh, place somewhere in, in, in Asia, right? So they were writing a novel and then they, a fictional place that is like a, a paradise, a very pretty place in Asia. So people at that time thought that there really is such a place, but then, you know, to the disappointment, you know, heaven is not on earth, okay? And then so on the lower left of this picture, uh, it's probably not seen, but generally is just want to highlight to you that uh, one of the only, uh, uh, okay, not really the only, one of the furthest probes that has landed on something, right, is the high, uh, this uh, hygiene's probe. Okay, so uh, landers are things that actually just set to land. So that means you just send this probe down, it just stands there, it doesn't move. Okay, so a rover is something that actually moves around. It has wheels, you know, that it can move around. So uh, hygiene's was uh, designed such that it will just land and it will just take pictures from that. Okay, so hydrogen is actually the furthest lander that we have sent, ever sent by, by humans in the solar system. Okay, so that means we have not sent something to land on Neptune or Uranus or in Pluto or anything beyond Saturn. Okay, so it has taken some pictures. You can actually go, go online to look for some uh, pretty pictures that hydrogen uh, has uh, taken. Okay, so moving on. Uh, Dr. Chonshu, we have a question from the audience. Yeah. So uh, can okay, we sure. potentially stay uh, on this Titan instead of Mars? <laughs> okay, that's a very good question. So, so Titan, uh, I, I can't remember the details. Okay, so the, the main thing is that Titan, the good thing about Titan is that because of the atmosphere, okay, it actually heats up, uh, you know, uh, something like the greenhouse effect, right? It actually heats up uh, uh, the Titan moon. And because of Saturn being opposite uh, Titan, so Saturn also gives heat, provides heat to Titan. So surprisingly, despite Titan and Saturn being so far away uh, from the sun, it actually has a relatively higher temperature, right? That, that could, okay, in fact, people are actually suggesting and thinking that it could maybe support life, right? So, the, but of course, the, the, the first thing that we want to answer, uh, we want to ask is that, how practical is it to send things over to Titan, right? And secondly, is there water? Okay, so the, the general consensus, of course, uh, getting to Mars takes about you know, uh, half a year to get there, right? So imagine getting to Saturn, you need to transport stuff, you need to terraform this place, and then uh, you need to see whether uh, are there uh, large supplies of water and whether can humans actually live in such uh, a condition, you know, where, where there's a methane rain and how do you actually change this environment? So I would say, uh, so if you, uh, to answer the question, is it possible to, to stay there? Probably not now, but if future, we can actually come up with some sort of a technology to, to terraform moons, or, or actually Titan would be one of the first few places that we want to see, right? So to, to check it out and, and to see what we can do with it, all right? Very good question. Okay, so uh, let's move on. Then this next picture over here, it looks like it looks like it's drawn, right? Like like someone just actually drew this, you know, a pre, uh, sand or something like that. So uh, for those of you who have seen a lot of uh, astronomical pictures, and then by looking at this word M R O over here and H I R I S E, you know that it's actually a picture from Mars. Okay, so these are what we call as uh, sand dunes. So you see the word dunes again, right? So basically they're just mounds of sand, right? So like just portions of sand that that just got built up. Okay, so this sand dune over here is uh, stripes. You, you see all these stripes. We do not know, okay, exactly how do these stripes uh, form. Okay, definitely not aliens. But then again, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, studies onto the formation of these dunes. Okay, so first of all, there is the seasons, right? Because uh, Mars also has seasons, right? So Earth, we have uh, summer, winter and all that. So in fact, uh, you should, it's, it's quite fun uh, to, to study the different seasons of uh, different uh, planets because they take both different uh, area, uh, amounts of time, right? So uh, if, if you want, the first thing you have to Google out, the fun thing about seasons is the seasons of Uranus. Okay, that's a really cool thing. But anyway, coming back, so it may be because of the seasons, maybe it's like the winter season in Mars that, that cause uh, uh, these things to sort of like, uh, you know, they, they actually freeze. And then after that, when they melt, you know, then uh, they, they form this kind of dunes all over the place. So this was taken by the Mars Reconnaissance uh, uh, Orbiter, MRO, 
Okay, so the thing that actually causes this that so far we are quite sure is basically carbon dioxide, CO2. Okay, so if you did your, your chemistry well in your secondary school, you may have remembered that carbon dioxide can be cool and it's also known as dry ice. Okay, and then what happens when you heat dry ice? It just evaporates. It doesn't, you know, form a liquid form. And this is actually the, the same thing that happens here. So during winter, okay, so uh, on Mars, these carbon dioxide, the, they, will, they are going to solidify and then they are going to like form, you know, uh, layers of uh, carbon dioxide ice or dry ice around uh, these sand dunes, okay? And when it is hot, when it comes to the summer season, the cool thing is that, you know, when it evaporates, it doesn't evaporate from the top to bottom, okay? It actually evaporates from bottom to top. So imagine that if you are, if you are on the, let me just draw it here, right? So if you're looking downwards, you have like a bunch of, of uh, carbon dioxide. And then when it gets change the season, the one that melts or evaporates uh, sublimes is the one that's the bottom layer. So what happens? They, they actually break through the top and then they form like, uh, uh, erupt like geysers. Right, so uh, creating these dark patterns that you see over here. Okay, so they are like pushing the sand out. So that's why you know you, you see these patterns like this. Okay, so so it's interesting. Uh, by the way, if you if you're interested to study the, the surface of Mars, you can actually uh, use uh, uh, Google Earth. Right, there's this app called Google Earth. You can download it for free, and then you can actually zoom in. You can select there's an option that you can look at the surface of Mars, and then you can zoom in to take a look at. The surface and see what you find. Okay, so um, due to time, the final one is actually just uh, is from the fourth of January and it's actually a YouTube video uh, taken by uh, this group of people. Okay, so it's basically a picture or a video of uh, Sprite Lightning. Okay, so it's about uh, here it says that it's a hundred thousand frames per second. So it's like lightning that actually happens on Earth. So this is not actually an astronom uh, astronomical uh, phenomena. It's just some mysterious burst of lightning that you see in the sky. Okay, so uh, let me uh, replay that again. All right, so this is, yeah, okay, it's replaying. All right, so, uh, so it's basically some lightning that is, we sort of like slow it down, right, to see, in order to see this uh, very bright sparks. So the question of scientists, obviously, is we want to study how it develops, what causes this, right? So we know of the usual lightning that happens, right? The usual lightning, just one, one single strike. But here we have something that, that goes, uh, you know, that, that actually, you know, just spreads out like a tree and then it just, where did it come from? What causes it? You know, these are things that people are trying to understand. Uh. Okay, so uh, what people have come up with is most likely is something to do with plasma, some irregularities that exist in the upper atmosphere. Okay, so is it uh, related to some sort of uh, astronomical particles, you know, that, that cause, we are not sure, right? So at least a simulation like this with, with 100,000 uh, frames per second, we can actually study something about that. Okay, so that's all from my side. So I'll pass the time back to Dr. Chong. Uh, uh, Dr. John, so before we uh, switch to Dr. Chong, there is earlier another question from Lai oh, Kong. He was asking whether uh, about the magnetic field of the uh, the galaxy earlier. Okay. okay so how do they know if the detected magnetic field lines are not the magnetic field lines of other clouds between the galaxy and the detectors? Okay, so, so we are talking about the magnetic field. Okay, so Okay, your question is whether the magnetic field, is it from something in the front, right? So for example, the, the, the galaxy at the back, and then whether is it the magnetic field caused by the thing in the front? So the, the answer is because the magnetic field is a property of the source of the light that comes out. Okay, so whatever is emitting light from the back, right, it will be polarized, that light, is, which has already some signatures of the magnetic field, right, within that source, it gets polarized, by the light, by, by the objects, uh, you know, maybe dust, you know, that they're pointing in a certain direction that causes it to polarize. And based on the magnitude of these polarizations, it is not because of this dust, right? So uh, the dust will change the direction or like it, it will cause only certain polarized direction of the light to pass through. But then the signature of whatever that passes through, right, is actually from the source itself. So we, we can say that you're 100% sure that, you know, that whatever the magnetic field that, that we see, that we, we study from there, it's not because of things uh, that, uh, po that that polarize the, the light in the front here, right? This dust. 
I mean, if it has to be from here, then it itself, it has to be producing the light source, right? So the main thing is to distinguish between what is the light, whether is it from the behind, whether is it from somewhere in between. But obviously, uh, based on the magnitude of the light uh, in whatever region they're looking, it's, it's quite uh, fairly simple to actually determine where the light source is from. Uh. So okay. to answer the question, it's from the source. It's definitely not from the dust. Okay, okay thank you. So we pass over to Dr. Chong. Okay, so uh, it's, all, it's all over already. Uh, 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 Chin Chong is over. I just, I want to present something here. Okay, we already uh, done all just that, just to, uh, for our viewers and listeners. Huh? So if you want to go to, oh, sorry, present again. Okay. So if you go to uh, this 12th of uh, what they call January, uh, about the Brazilian old man one, uh, you go below. Uh, actually, previously, our uh, Dr. Robert Nemirov and Dr. Jerry Bonnell only have English only export. But some years ago, they have beautiful. It's now available in Arabic, Catalan. Catalan is uh, part of Spanish. Uh, they have our, our, what they call this, Barcelona Football Club, uh, Catalan, Spanish, Chinese of Beijing, Chinese of Taiwan. Croatian, Czech Republic, Dutch, Farsi means Persian, na, Iranian, na, French, German, Hebrew, Israeli, Indonesian, which Malay, Malay can, can, can come here from Malay. Japanese, Korean, Montenegrin, a small country in Europe near to Serbia, right? Polish, Russian, Serbian, Slovenian, Spanish, Taiwanese, Turkish, and Ukrainian. So now we can enjoy iPod in other languages. So for our our other Chinese students, uh, you either go for Chinese Beijing or Chinese Taiwan. And then for our Malay students, you can go for Indonesia. That's what I want to say. Right? So I think that's about all for me. Huh? So I think tonight is okay for me. Dr. John Su, congratulations. Nice explanation. Okay? That's also right. Huh? So that's all for me. Any more questions, uh, Michael? Uh, no, I think that's all. We don't have much questions uh, today. So uh, again, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you to our presenters today. So I hope the audience uh, enjoyed the session today as we go through all these wonderful photos from the January uh, collection of the uh, sort of astronomy picture of the days. So uh, again, uh, a reminder that we are going to have this uh, airport uh, virtual tour session at the last Saturday of every month. So uh, we'll see you again next month. There's one, one more thing to remind the watchers. Like, are we going to do the landing of Perseverance, the, the NASA uh, Mars lander? 18 of, yeah. 18 of February, 18 of February. On Chinese New Year break? Yeah, la, that's the time. Huh? We check and see whether we can cover. Huh? Yeah. Okay, we, we, we will see and then we, we will announce if we will have the session. If we have the All session. Right. Yeah, okay. sure, you may follow our Facebook page for any upcoming uh, events. So basically, we will, we are now most of our activities are online. So we have different, uh, on the second Saturday, we have this Astro Cafe, where we are going to discuss the different topics. So you can also watch our past session, uh, all the Astro Cafe, our live, our airport session on uh, our YouTube channel. Okay, mm -hmm. Do subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any of them. Yes. Okay, so I think that's all for tonight. Okay, good night, everyone. Okay. And thank you again to the okay. presenter. Well good night. Bye. Marcus, bye bye. Huh? Marcus, we we'll discuss later for next month. Coming now. Okay. Uh, bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Bye 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 bye.